Good morning and welcome back to the 2023 Ligonier National Conference. I'm Nathan W. Bingham and I'm glad you can join us live as we continue with this year's conference theme, Stand Firm. Although the world around us is constantly changing, Hebrews 13.8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The Lord is our anchor and our solid rock and we can have firm footing as we look to Him and stand on His grace. And I hope this conference has been a great encouragement to you so far. I want to remind you that you can watch all of yesterday's messages again in the free Ligonier app. Just visit ligonier.org app or search for Ligonier in your app store of choice. Today's live teaching will start shortly with Dr. Sinclair Ferguson. He's about to deliver a message titled Pursuing Godly Marriages. And it's a very timely subject, don't you think? Because there are many attempts today to redefine marriage and to reject the reality that God created us male and female. But as we'll soon hear, the Bible provides instructions for husbands and wives so that our marriages and our families may shine as light in a dark world. Dr. Ferguson will be live with us in just a moment. Well, it's kind of embarrassing to be a podcaster at my age, <laughs> so I cannot blame those of you who are not subscribed. And uh, speaking of being discombobulated, I, um, 
I had a visitation about three o'clock in the morning, um, I think related to the discussion in the session yesterday on Roman Catholic baptism, and I was visited by a Roman Catholic cardinal <laughs> who told me that there was going to be a new council and it would be possible to talk behind closed doors. Well, our topic is pursuing godly marriages, and I think all of us realize from the oldest to probably the very youngest that this is a topic of immense significance in the times in which we are living, but it's also always a very sensitive topic for us because as we come to a conference like this in the numbers in which we do, uh, we come in varied conditions in relationship to marriage. Uh, some of us have lost our marriage. Some of us uh, think marriage is very far off in the future. Some of us may have reconciled ourselves never to be married. Some of us undoubtedly come with strains in our marriage. Uh, and some of us perhaps naively come in the assumption uh, that we have found the perfect marriage. And I want us to try to consider in this very brief time that we have, not everything that Scripture has to say about marriage, because it begins in Genesis 1 and it really ends in Revelation chapter 22, but to focus on one or two passages of Scripture, and during the course of the next 40 minutes, I think I will probably refer to no more than five passages of Scripture. But I want to read the first of them in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. In these words familiar to us in Genesis 1:26, then God said, let us make man as our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man as His own image. As the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And then Moses uses a word that is always associated in Scripture with God's gracious covenant, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. We live, of course, in a very unusual and stressful cultural moment. Uh, many people who are Christian believers of my generation constantly say to me, how can this have happened so quickly? But the truth of the matter, the distortions of marriage and gender and sexuality that have taken place have not in fact happened as quickly as we imagine. Uh, we live uh, in a small village in the Grampian Highlands in Scotland, uh, if some of you will be able to picture where our late queen had her holiday residence, we live about 10 minutes along the road from that castle. And between her castle and our modest home, there stands another castle on the banks of the River Dee, an old Scottish keep. And about seven years ago, our beautiful River Dee overflooded the banks. It swamped half of the houses in our village and almost toppled this castle on the edge of the River Dee, and people's reaction was, why did the idiot build his castle on the edge of the River Dee, when the truth of the matter is that he had built his castle at some distance from the River Dee? But over the centuries, over the decades, the River Dee had changed its course and eaten into the river bank and made its way up to the very edge of his house that, were it not for the help of others, would undoubtedly have toppled into the sea. 
And this is exactly what has happened in relationship to issues of gender and sex and marriage in our own time. Undoubtedly, there has been a strategy begun and often masterminded by intellectuals essentially to do one thing, to tear God from His throne, and therefore as a result to inevitably begin to deconstruct every single one of His creation ordinances, the central of which and the apex of which is what we have read in Genesis chapter 1, that when He made man as His image, He made man male and female. And as the author of Genesis puts this story under the microscope in chapter 2, we read what this combination of, as it were, antitheses is meant to teach us. Very interesting, isn't it, in Genesis chapter 1, whenever God creates anything, then immediately there follows a discrimination, a distinction in what He has made. There is a kind of pairing goes on all the way through the chapter until instead of in 126, God creating man simply by divine fiat, it's very evident, isn't it, when you feel the chapter coming to its climax at this point, that God now enters into divine counsel with Himself, as though to announce that what is about to be created is the apex of everything. It's where creation has been going. It's where He is going to most clearly manifest His glory in the creation of man and in the creation of man, as we read here, as male and female. And it shouldn't surprise us, Romans 1, 18 to 32 has been mentioned already several times during the course of the conference, that when people begin to worship the creature rather than the Creator, when the when the glory of God is distorted and defaced and rejected, it is actually intellectually and sociologically inevitable that the significance of man made as the image of God will begin to disappear, first of all, from the way people think about themselves and the application of it to male and female will, first of all, become distorted in false sexuality and then rebelled against in antagonism, and eventually, of course, as has happened in our own time, making the claim of equality of opportunity eventually end up in social dominance. So that what is sin in Scripture becomes righteousness in the 21st century, and what is godliness in Scripture becomes one of the great sins of the age in which people proclaim their own truth. That is the external reason why it's so important for us to be well grounded in the biblical teaching on marriage. It's also the reason and in some ways, this is what we need to press upon ourselves. In some ways, it underlines the importance in an ungodly society of Christian believers having marriages that so shine in the darkness of that ungodly society that out of the darkness the light shines. And even those who say they hate the message of the Christian gospel and hate what this couple professed to believe, find themselves confronted with this beautiful reality that they see in this married couple, an echo of how life was originally meant to be. And they themselves, in our neighborhoods where we work, as they see the recreation that God is working in the marriages of Christians begin to feel a, a, a thirst in their throats because we are the salt of the earth, and our marriages make them thirsty for such a marriage, and the light of the world, and a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, 
because no matter how unconscious we are ourselves of the atmosphere that our marriages communicate within our home and family and to those who have any association with us, it is undoubtedly true that this ordinance of creation, this marvel of recreation that Jesus Christ has given to us is surely one of the beacon points of Christian witness in a world without Christ. And if that's to be true, then I think there are two things that we need to grasp, and I'm going to try and work through them very simply. I say two things, but both of these two things have a number of subordinate headings. If our marriages are to portray what my friend Glyn Harrison calls a better story than the narrative of this present age, then we first of all need to understand the biblical doctrine of marriage, and then we need to have some grasp of the biblical teaching on the application of these principles to our marriage. And it's these two things I want us to reflect on for these few minutes. First of all, the biblical doctrine of marriage. And of course, the beautiful thing is that that biblical doctrine is embedded in the opening two chapters of Scripture, the passage that we read, which gives us the, the macro picture of creation. And then in Genesis 2, in greater detail in verses 18 through 25, this micro picture where, where the, the producer's and director's camera focuses in the garden on, on this couple who are being brought together by God's grace and in His mercy. And as certainly um, every minister explains to every couple who are going to be married, what is going to take place in your wedding service is an echo of what took place in this first wedding service, when a father brought a woman to the man to whom she was going to be bound. And it's for this reason that when we get married, one of the simplest and most important things for us to understand is that while marriage is not a sacrament of the gospel, it is a beautiful presentation of the story of creation. And because it's a powerful representation of the story of creation and how marriage was originally intended to be, your wedding service, and I've often said to couples who are being married, especially to the girl, the sooner you can forget about this wedding service being yours, the better. It is about you, but it's not really for you. And if you grasp that and pray this, then by God's grace, your wedding service may lead to the recovery of fragmented marriages, may reorient single people who are there, may bring such marvelous refreshment to those who have been faithful in their marriage to recognize that this is really one of the most glorious gifts that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. But what is it for? Well, let me suggest that we find here in Genesis 2 especially that our marriage, according to this creation prototype, is for four things. First of all, it is for deep companionship. And it's interesting, I think, that this was one of the places in which the Reformation reversed the tradition of the medieval church, and indeed of the church that has continued from the Middle Ages. In that church, the first reason for marriage is the procreation of children. In biblical marriage, in the Reformation tradition, the first reason for marriage is deep companionship. Genesis 2, 18, these beautiful words, it is not good that the man should be alone. Interesting, isn't it? It's only when God has created the man and the woman that everything is very good. This is the capstone of creation, and what it's intended for is this deep 
companionship. Now, yes, there is such a phenomenon as romantic love, but no solid marriage is ever going to be built on romantic love. Solid marriages are based on best friendships, on this kind of companionship where we can gaze upon one another in the knowledge that we share a secret union that none else shares, and there is someone who is there for us. I remember as a teenager, and uh, I think I may tell you my Neither my dad nor my mum gave me the talk about the birds and the bees, and I think I thought you uh, got children by holding hands with a girl. Um, but I remember reading a book by the Yale scholar Roland Bainton on sex, love, and marriage in the Reformation, and I was surprised to read there as a teenager that in the Reformation, men and women didn't get married because they fell in love they fell in love because they had got married. And what seems so curious to us who have been so influenced by Hollywood and its facade of terribly sad people often portraying glorious experiences, that this is actually the biblical teaching. There is a, there is a kind of moment here in the Genesis story where you get a touch of romance. But the big thing in the Genesis story is that this woman has been made for this man to be his lifelong best friend. If you read through the Old Testament, there are, there are one or two narratives of, of how a couple get married. And perhaps the, the most beautiful one, the one that Gertie called the most beautiful short story in the world is the story of Ruth and Boaz. And there's a word that recurs like a drumbeat through the little book of Ruth that really underlines for us what is absolutely central to biblical marriage. It's the word chesed, loyalty, love, friendship. It was this chiefly that Boaz saw in Ruth, and this chiefly that Boaz demonstrated to Ruth. Uh, one could put it this way, if you are contemplating marriage, uh, one of the things you need to ask about uh, your potential spouse is, is this man or this woman going to be my lifelong best friend? because that's why God gave this gift of marriage for deep companionship and loyal love. But yes, also secondly, for mutual enjoyment. And that, I think, comes to expression, doesn't it, in the first words that Adam speaks here. Um, this is really quite interesting, because all of this happens apparently on the very first day of Adam's creation. He sees the woman that God brings to him, verse 22 of chapter 2, and then if you're using a modern version, you'll notice that the next statement is set out in poetic form. He breaks into poetry. He breaks into song, and he says, at last. Now, that's rather curious, isn't it? I mean, he is not a, a single day old yet. But the, the at last refers not so much to how is it taking you so long to bring this beauty to me, but the fact that this woman is the last of a long line of kind of potential best friends. I mean, you can see here, I was listening to my dear friend Derek Thomas speaking about dogs in the resurrection life, and you can, you can see Adam in Derek Thomas fashion, going moochie, moochie, moochie into the face of the dog, <laughs> but then coming back and saying, you know, I'm too intelligent for this to do for me. <laughs> and then she appears, and he says, wow, at last. 
And there's a, there's a kind of tail end to that, isn't there, at the end of the chapter, in which in this, these words that I remember years ago, R.C. Sproul describing as the concluding unscientific postscript, which is a title of a book by Soren Kierkegaard. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Christians over the years have been very sensitive about the idea of the nude, haven't they? And, and understandably so, because we're fallen creatures. But the sheer beauty of the man and the woman made as the image of God, that, that not only meets me in terms of, of my social needs, but my aesthetic pleasures. And it's all here. I almost laugh when I hear people say, why is it that you Christians are always banging on about sex? And I want to say, we are not the ones who do that. We're in a world that worships sex, often distorted sex, and that's why we react, because we have a higher view of this. We have a real view of beauty. We have a right aesthetic. We understand what beauty is. And what beauty is here, I remember reading somewhere, it's very difficult to tell what beauty is, but one simple test is, take a photograph of yourself and fold it over in the middle, and if both halves meet exactly, then you are a beauty. Don't even think about doing that. It will depress you for the rest of your life. <laughs> but what is actually true, and I think is true here in creation, is that beauty is a real match between what a person is physically and what a person is in character, and both of them are present here. And the beauty of regeneration and life of a married couple is both of them are present. I mean, if they were to turn on all the lights and the men were able to go around every single woman here, it would only be eventually when they found their wives that they would say, at last. There may be several thousand women in this… I, I'm going to get into trouble for this. There may be several thousand women in this room that you wouldn't even think about marrying. But what you found in the woman you married was that however quirky she looked to other people, you saw in what she was physically and what she was spiritually and in terms of character, that, that these two things matched. You know, one of the awful things about so many marriage guidance gurus is that they speak or write as though God meant that one size fits all. But what God does in creation is He makes one size fit one size. So, it's not that beauty is in the eye of the beholder simply. It's often that beauty is hidden from the eyes of other beholders to see what you see. So, yes, God gives creation for deep companionship, for mutual enjoyment, and then, obviously, for shared activity. You notice in verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And there are two things there. There is the idea of the etzer, the helper. Uh, the, if one can put it this way, the, and some of us know this by sheer experience, the helplessness of the man who is, who is without the woman, to be, to be able to function um, but also there's this idea that this helper is fit for him. Uh, you know how sometimes people describe, if you ask them, how did you meet and how did you get together? They say, well, there was just something that clicked. And of course that's true both for Christians and for non-Christians, because this is not a redemptive ordinance, this is a creation ordinance. There is an instinct in us to use that language because it reflects this language. God made a helper that clicked with him. She is exactly what I need. And of course, that's one of the beauties that we see 
in real marriage, the sense of help, the sense of being fitted to one another, clicking, the sense that we belong together. I had a dear friend, an older student at seminary who uh, eventually died of an inoperable brain tumor, and uh, I remember sharing a room with him at the, at the seminary student conference, and he was going over and over and over again that everybody who knew him thought, you had better just either die or marry this woman. She is to die for. And he was fussing, and, you know, it was all the man thing of, you know, basically not being prepared to commit. And when he died, I had the privilege of writing a little memoir of his life, and I found these words that he had written in his journal just as he got to the point of proposing to this wonderful, wonderful woman who was such a blessing to him. He said, I realized that we would be more together than either of us could be separately. And that's what Genesis is speaking about here, and it's so very beautiful. And then, of course, the fourth element is the element of covenant commitment. And we find that, don't we, here in verse uh, 29, uh, 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. You know, one of the reasons for the transformation in marriage statistics but not so much that people ceased to believe in marriage, but that people became so self-obsessed that they were unwilling to make a radical commitment to another human being. And therefore, it's not surprising that they never really found themselves, because in a wonderful sense, that is what marriage is really for. And although it may seem inelegant of Moses to use the language, if you've got really, really good eyesight, you'll notice something in one of these footnotes. I think it may be footnote number eight, that God did two things. The first thing was He built the woman. The second thing was He brought the woman. And in a sense, that's the essence of the whole thing. That's the, the marvel. That is actually the romance of the whole road that leads us to marriage, which is quite simply that the Lord builds somebody for us. I know that sounds a little inelegant. I don't know what shape or size that means, but what it implies is that God has done this lovingly, personally, beautifully, and this is his gift for me. And so, he reenacts for us in Genesis chapter 2, the story we reenact in our own marriages, the truth that refreshes our own marriages, that it's God who began the good work which He has continued and given to us. And if that, however superficially, is the basic Christian doctrine of marriage, then it shouldn't surprise us that since this is the apex of creation, that God makes man and woman, and then also that within that context, because not every man, not every woman in Scripture is married, but within that context of creating man and woman, He also creates marriage… And we understand that male and female is actually the apex, whether there is marriage or not, and that marriage, in a sense, is the blessed icing on the cake of that relationship, then it shouldn't surprise us that this is where the enemy attacks. And this, of course, is exactly what happens in Genesis chapter 3, the disintegration of the relationship, the disintegration of the family and then the disintegration of society, and you're not out of chapter 4 before you discover uh, a scenario that is so reminiscent of today, of adultery, and of violence, and of the disintegration of God's very best gift. And we need to begin to recover this story. Actually, there's a very enigmatic indication that the gospel recovers this story 
in the passage in 1 Corinthians 11 that we all think of as the passage about head covering. If you can just get that out of your mind for a minute, and remember what Paul says in that context. He says that man has been made as the image of God, and the woman is the glory of the man. And it seems to me that is a, a bachelor's inspired by the Spirit insight into what the restoration of biblical marriage looks like, that in that relationship, the glory of the relationship is seen in the woman, not just in the man. And the man understands that where his dignity will be most apparent is in the woman to whom he has committed himself. Well, that leads us briefly to our second consideration. And I should have told you at the beginning that the second consideration, the practical application, would be shorter, and it certainly now needs to be, not because it's less important, but because we, understand, we all understand in this room that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds so that when we capture the biblical vision of marriage, then the application of that is energized. Is this the blessing God may have for me? Is this the blessing God has given to me? Then, of course, A, B, C, and D will follow. But Scripture doesn't leave us to our own devices here, and you'll remember especially how Paul works this out in Ephesians chapter 5. And I think it's important that when we read the marriage section in Ephesians chapter 5, we, we don't allow our eyes immediately to go to the paragraph about husbands and wives or wives and husbands, but that we take in the whole of what Paul is saying here, because you'll remember how chapter 5 begins. It begins, in a sense, back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. What's the first word in chapter 5? Therefore, be imitators, be images, be likenesses of God as beloved children. You see what he's doing? He's taking us all back, as it were, to the Garden of Eden. And he's saying what, what the gospel is doing, he is, the gospel is beginning to restore you to the way things were. In, in all their purity, originality, and beauty, and yes, glory. And that means two things. If you're going to be an imitator of your heavenly Father, then like Christ, you must walk in love, and in Christ, you must walk in wisdom. Walk in love in verse 2. And you know how immediately he, he contrasts walking in love with sexual immorality? And then walking in wisdom in verse 15, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And you remember Genesis 3, they gave way to the creature that was the wisest and most subtle creature of all. So, these beautiful echoes of Genesis chapters 1 through 3. And then there is this statement in verse 21, that the way in which this will come to manifest itself as you give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ there is this mutual submission that pervades the Christian's relationship with others. And in a sense, that's the principle that we need to grasp, first of all, if we're going to understand the atmosphere of what Paul says in verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands. That's not an oppressive statement. That's a statement saying there is a very special application of the general principle governing all Christian relationships expressed in verse 21 in this unique relationship between the husband and the wife. And as he begins to expand that, there are some very important principles, I think, for us to grasp. But I do want to emphasize that they are principles. Um, I've had a kind of long concern that when it comes to, to um, preparing young couples for marriage in the church where we take marriage seriously, we've, we've tended to look to the professionals. 
instead of looking to old Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who sit at the back of the church, I think if I were giving marriage guidance counsel to uh, a young couple, I would ask them who they knew in the church. And if they said they knew old Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I would say, I will take you through the marriage service, but sit down together with a list of questions and go and visit old Mr. and Mrs. Smith, because they've done it. They're not gurus in their thirties telling you how to have the perfect marriage, <laughs> often transforming biblical principles in their application of it back into principles that aren't actually biblical. And so, you hear them or read what they say, and you are wrecked because you know you cannot meet that standard, when that standard is sometimes their own arrogant projection of how they are married onto your marriage. And uh, I think especially with, with women, that has often brought women to a sense of inadequacy and paralysis in their marriage but your marriage isn't their marriage. And to be absolutely honest about it, you do not know how marriages have worked out until the children are well into their thirties at least, because that often is going to be the expression of your marriage. So, what are Paul's principles? Well, they're fairly obvious, aren't they? The first is the nature of the wife's devotion to her husband in her role as helpmeet. Dear younger ones, if you, are, if, you are, if you are on the verge of marriage or have aspiration to a particular individual, that's one of the questions you really do need to ask. Is this the man to whom I want to be a helpmeet? Do not enter marriage with the notion of, I will change him. <laughs> and that's how all this emerges. And the interesting thing is the extent to which this devotion presupposes that the man is worthy of respect. Verse 33, and uh, incidentally, says Paul, see that you respect your husband. That's often the, the first question I would ask a, a girl on her own, do you respect him? And sometimes you can see a look of nervousness come across her face because she doesn't actually respect him. But you see, if marriage is about companionship, companionship is about respect, not about his or her perfection, but about your sense, this person, yes, with all his limitations, yes, of course he's a sinner, but there are these qualities that I'm able to respect. That, I think, is why this famous saying from the Middle Ages, it goes back, I think, at least to Peter of Lombard, is so right on that the man is worthy of respect. And that's why the woman not only respects him, but sees herself as his helpmeet and therefore is willing to come alongside him in that capacity. Because, as Lombard says, she was not made out of his head to rule him, nor from his feet to be trampled under him, but out of his side to be cared for by him, near to his heart to be loved by him, and under his arm to be protected by him. We truly do have a better story. And this is why, as Paul goes on, who has the greater challenge, the woman or the man, that the man is urged to see Christ's sacrifice on the cross as the model of his love for his wife, looking to nurture and to nourish her? And when that is true, we see great beauty. I used to look out of my office window. Some people from the church in Columbia here, they don't know this. I've never said this. I'm not sure I've said it to anybody. I used to look out my church wind, my office window just as people were gathering for the second morning service to see a member of the congregation who had been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And his citation was extraordinary. 
getting out of his car, going to the passenger side, and helping his handicapped wife out of the car. And I used to think, that's what Paul is speaking about. That is so beautiful. So, as I said at the beginning, we are a great mixture here. Some of us aspirants to marriage, some of us engaged, some of us newly wed, some of us with marriages gone cold, some of us with marriages that have been fractured, some of us who are like Paul who have been called to singleness. But it's vital for our churches, for our society, for our witness to the gospel that what God gave in the Garden of Eden is restored in the gardens of our lives. So, let's take a moment of quiet together. And I'm going to do two things as we close, and then I'll ask you to have another moment of quiet, because this is really so important to us all. And then Chris will return to the podium. Let's bow together. I want to quote to you, first of all, some words I've often quoted at weddings from a missionary to Egypt by the name of Temple Gairdner, who wrote this on the evening of his marriage, and perhaps if marriage lies in the future, you can pray it with him. And if you are married, you can be refreshed by it, that I may come nearer to her draw me nearer to thee than to her, that I may know her, make me to know thee more than her, that I may love her with the perfect love of a perfectly whole heart, cause me to love thee more than her, and best of all. And then, if I may, I want to do something else to refresh those of us who are married, to encourage those of us who are on the way to be married. And since this is the United States, it's okay to take your spouse's hand. Will you have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor her, and keep her in sickness and in health? And forsaking all other, keep you only to her, as long as you both shall live. And will you have this man to be your wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? And will you honor him and serve him, love him and keep him in sickness and in health? And forsaking all other, keep thee only to him, as long as you both shall live. Lord, give us such marriages, we pray, now and into the future, that we may shine as lights in a dark place, be salt, be cities set on hills, that Jesus Christ may be praised. We ask it in His name. Amen. You've just heard an important message from Dr. Sinclair Ferguson on God's good design for marriage. I appreciate Dr. Ferguson's teaching, and my wife and I have really benefited from his book, In the Year of Our Lord. During the conference, you can request a free copy of the ebook edition. In 20 brief chapters, Dr. Ferguson will take you through an overview of 20 centuries of church history with memorable stories and even Christian hymns from throughout the ages. You can get your free ebook at ligonier.org slash year. Now is a great time to request this resource as we're heading into a very quick break here in Orlando, but we'll be back in only a few minutes with Dr. Michael Reeves. He'll provide us with foundational teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity. So stay close. We'll return shortly. Many of us feel overwhelmed. We can start to believe what the world has been telling us for years. To believe the Bible is a leap of faith. To say that Jesus Christ is the only way to know God is arrogant. The temptation is to retreat and take our gospel hope with us. It's time for us to recapture that vision, to take back lost ground. It's time to renew 
our minds.
Michigan Ears National Conference so far. We'd love to hear what you're learning. On social media, if you use the hashtag LIGCON, that's L-I-G-C-O-N, you can tell us about the insights you've gained, some of the moments that you've appreciated, or quotes from our speakers that have stood out to you. And please remember, you can share the conference live stream with your family and friends to help extend the reach of this teaching. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Reeves, and his message is titled, The Triunity of God. The doctrine of the Trinity can sometimes seem daunting to Christians, yet understanding God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can deeply enrich our Christian lives. And as Dr. Reeves is about to explain, this truth can also help embolden us to stand firm in our faith today. Good morning, friends. Well, we here this morning, we are the children of the Reformation. We care about the sort of truths that Luther and Calvin and friends fought for in the Reformation. We care about salvation as a gift of pure grace, being declared righteous by God, not because we've been righteous ourselves, but because Christ clothes us with His righteousness. We care about those sweet truths. But what has the Trinity to do with all that? What possible difference can the Trinity make to those beautiful truths about salvation that the Reformers fought for, that we love? How does the Trinity shape the gospel that we cherish? And what we're going to see this morning is that the triune nature of God is the mold for the gospel. The fact that God is Father, Son, and Spirit shapes the gospel. Everything beautiful about the gospel is only so because God is triune. The Trinity gives our gospel its character, its flavor, and all the gratuity and comfort of the gospel that Luther would fight for in the Reformation, all of it found its source in the triune nature of God. And Luther actually was absolutely clear on this. Right at the very beginning of the Reformation, Luther called the Trinity the highest article on which all others depend. So, let's look at the Trinity, particularly through Paul's letter to the Romans. So, I want to get a big picture view of Romans, but let's start with 
the first few verses, how he introduces the letter. Romans 1, verses 1 to 4. Here's how Paul introduces the gospel. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, for Paul, do you see, the gospel is Trinitarian. It is, verse 1, the gospel of God. That is, it is the good news of the Father, verse 3, concerning his Son, who, verse 4, was declared Son of God in power according to the Spirit. Now, straight away, this is a very different way to start thinking of the Trinity to what we often see. Haven't you been in a Bible study group? And a young Christian says, so can someone tell me about the Trinity, please? And what sort of answers do you get? You'll get someone going, ah, yes, the Trinity. Mm. I like to think of the Trinity a bit like a shamrock leaf. It's, it's one leaf, but it's got three bits sticking out of it, just like God. And someone else says, no, I find it really helpful to think of God is like H2O. It's like one thing, but three kind of ways of being that one thing. It could be ice, water, or steam. So, you know, you have the father, warm him up a bit and he becomes sunny. <laughs> Keep warming it up and it all becomes more spiritual. <laughs> or someone else says, no, 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 Trinity is, is like an egg. There's the shell, the yolk, and the white, but it's one egg. And we wonder why the world laughs. And people think, of course this is irrelevant. Who is going to bow down in awe at the eggishness of God? <laughs> and so we think, of course let's leave this bizarre doctrine to the sort of socially disastrous theologians who like discussing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. But Paul here believes in the Trinity, not because he senses God's similarity to eggs or H2O, but because of the gospel. And what we'll see throughout Romans is the importance of knowing, chapter 1, verse 7, God our Father who sends his son that we might have peace with him. That he sends the spirit of sonship that we might be sons of God crying, Abba, Father. And so what Paul sees in the gospel is that the living God is eternally a father. And why eternally? Well, if at any time the father did not have a son, he simply would not be father. For it, it's not as if God the father is something else un, underneath that at some point he chose to become a father. If that's how it is, then it's like he's got a nice blob of fatherly icing on top, but he's something else deep down before he chose to become a father. No, no. He is father all the way down. That is his eternal identity. For that to be true, for his essential identity to be father, he must eternally have a son. And so, to be who he is, this God, the Father, must have a son. To be 
father then means to love, to beget the son. And therefore, this God would not be who he is if he did not love. For eternity, before the foundation of the world, the Father has been loving the Son, John 17, 24, pouring out his Spirit on him. And so we see, because our God is triune, and only because our God is triune, we can say, God is love. And so we begin to see why the Trinity is such good news. God is love because God is Trinity. Because for eternity the Father has been positively bursting out with love for his Son. And you get a picture of this in the baptism of Jesus. And if you ever want an illustration of the Trinity, rather than H2O, this is the place to go. There, the Father of the Jordan, at the baptism of Jesus, the Father declares his love for the Son and his pleasure in him as the Spirit rests on him like a dove. For the Spirit is the one who makes the love of the Father known, causing the Son to cry, Abba. And there's this lovely moment in Luke 10 where we read Jesus, full of joy in the Holy Spirit, cried, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. For the Father's love for him poured out through the Spirit fills him with an answering delight in the Father. So I hope you see it that when you start with the gospel, the triune God doesn't come across as an irrelevant philosophical headache. Here is a God who is love, a father loving his son in the fellowship of the Spirit. And all this means that the very nature of the triune God, it is at complete odds with the nature of all other gods. Have you ever thought about the gods of human religion? All of them share something in common. They are needy. They need us to serve or worship them. They're weak. So just imagine a god who is a single person sitting alone on his throne for eternity by himself, what's he like? Lonely, solitary. So why would he create the world? To get some friends, to get some slaves. See, such a God needs us. His glory is like a black hole sucking in. Taking, but the triune God doesn't need us at all. The Father's never been lonely. For eternity, he's been perfectly satisfied in his glorious Son. Needing nothing, he has life in himself, and so much so, he's brimming over with it. His glory is radiant and outflowing. The Son shows this glory in going out from the Father. The Father begets his Son eternally, and the Son then goes out from the Father as the bright radiance of his Father's glory. For that's what this God is like. Not needy, but full, overflowing, fruitful. And that is why this God can relate to us by sheer grace. 
No other God can do that. And I think there's an enormous challenge for the church here today that we must make it more obvious that we do not believe in just any God. We believe in this God. For people assume when we say God that the living God is just the same as all the idols and bores of human imagination and religion. But in the gospel, we see the only God who is love, who is overflowing, who is sufficient, the God beyond the tiresome idols of human imagination. And therefore, only with this God is there the possibility of salvation by grace or salvation at all. Do you know, let's take Islam as an example. In Islam, there is no word for salvation because there is no such thing. In Islam, the closest word you have would be translated as success. Isn't that revealing? The triune God of love offers salvation. Allah requires success. No, there is no salvation without the Trinity. And we can see this in Romans 3. Let's start jogging on a bit through Romans. Romans 3 from verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Now, you see, if God were not triune, if the Father had no Son to die in our place, well, God would have to make some third party suffer to achieve atonement. In other words, we would have to provide a perfect man to die in our place. We would have to provide the substitute because God would have none to offer us. We would have to produce the perfect one, but that's not grace. God would have done nothing for us and that's not possible. It is only because the Father has a Son that God can accomplish the entire work of salvation himself. He provides the sufficient sacrifice. It is because God is triune that the cross works. So there is no salvation without the Trinity. But I think Christians do often present a Trinity light gospel. So try this as an account of the gospel. See if it sounds familiar. It's the story of the heavenly school principal and his naughty students. It goes like this. We've all been caught breaking the rules, and so we're due a long detention. But then along comes a nice classmate called Jesus, and he takes the punishment for us so we can go home with a clean report. Sound familiar? Now, there's much in there that does echo some of the lines of the gospel. But there was nothing about the Trinity there. And therefore, that account of the gospel was deeply defective. Because you started with a God who's not a father, eternally loving his son. But what if... What if before all things in eternity past, you do start with a God who is a father, whose very life has been about loving, delighting in his precious son, who so enjoyed loving his son, he wants to spread that love. Then you see a different gospel. Then you see the gospel of a God whose ultimate aim is not to send us home with a clean school report, but to draw us in to his life and joy 
to embrace us with the very love with which he has for his dear son. The nature of God radically shapes the nature of the salvation he would offer. See, if God is just a solitary individual who's decided he wants a creation to rule over, then salvation is just about becoming a law-abiding citizen under his rule. That's it. But if God is a father loving his son, then the gospel is something far sweeter. Salvation is about becoming spirit-anointed sons of God. More than just forgiven, more than righteous, adopted. And here, ultimately and beautifully, is how the Trinity shapes the gospel. So come and have a look with me at Romans 8 now, which captures this Trinitarian shape to our salvation so wonderfully. And I want to start with the surprise. Okay, this is outrageous language that Paul uses. Ladies pay special attention for how culturally offensive this is. Verse 14, ladies, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Ah, oh, misogyny. <laughs> well, Scripture does sometimes speak of, uh, generically, of children of God, but Paul here wants us to be clear. The status of all believers are given is quite specifically the status of the son himself. You know, the men have to make peace with being part of the bride of Christ, so we've all got issues here. <laughs> but it means this isn't a sexist thing to talk of our sonship. It's about being clear, all believers, we share in nothing less than what the Son himself has naturally. Because the Father doesn't just give us some exalted semi-angelic status. We can imagine that, can't we? Yes, the Father loves his Son, and then ugh, the children of God. No, the Son shares with us his own sonship. Paul goes on in verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit of adoption. Or in Galatians 4.4, 4, he calls, it the, calls him the spirit of his son, united to the son. And so adopted in him, sharing his sonship, the children of God receive the very spirit, the comforter of the son. Which is why he makes us cry the very cry of the son. Abba. And isn't that strange in this holy Greek letter, there's, Paul inserts this one Aramaic word to remind us of Mark 14, where Jesus, praying in the garden in private, is talking to his father and calls him Abba, Father. Echoing that, Paul is showing us as intimately as he can, sonship means being given by grace the very relationship with the Father that the Son himself eternally and naturally has enjoyed. So we come before the Father, the Most High, as Jesus does. The Father's eternal love for the Son encompasses us. John Calvin said, 
that Christ's aim in all that he did was to restore us to God's grace and so make the children of men children of God, to make the heirs of Gehenna heirs of the heavenly kingdom. That is the aim of redemption. Now, friends, if God was not a father, he could never give us the right to be his children. If he did not enjoy eternal fellowship with his son, you have to wonder, does he have any fellowship to share with us? Does he know what fellowship is? A single person God wouldn't. If, for example, the son was a creature, distant from the father, what sort of relationship with God could he share with us? If the son himself had never been close to the father, how could he bring us close? If God was a single person, if the father has no son, salvation would look entirely different. Such a God might possibly might allow us to live under his rule and protection, but it would be at a distance. We'd probably have to approach him through intermediaries. He, maybe he might offer forgiveness, but he, he couldn't offer closeness. He just couldn't do it. And since by definition he wouldn't be eternally loving, you have to ask, would he deal with the price of sin himself and offer forgiveness for free? No. Distant hirelings we would remain if God was a single person. And we would never hear the son's golden words to his father. Father, you have loved them even as you have loved me. Brush your teeth with those words every morning. <laughs> this gospel of this God gives us such intimate access to the Holy One, beloved children of the Most High. No other God could bring us so close and have us so loved. No other God could so win our hearts. Without this God, we could never say, Our Father. But we can. We pray as it were, through the mouth of Jesus and our Father delights to hear the calls of his children. And that enables a hearty prayer life. You see, if that's what it is, I can approach the emperor of the universe as my loving, pure Father. That means prayer becomes a delightful privilege. And once again, it all means you've got a salvation that is by grace from first to last. See, if salvation is not about being adopted into the family of the Father, the grace is not so clear. See, we often speak of salvation like this. We say our problem is God's standards are really high and our standards aren't good enough. And that's our problem. But if that's our only problem, you know what we're all going to do. God's standards are high. I know we're not doing well enough. We'll try a bit harder. But if salvation is to be adopted as children into the family of the Father, then our performance can have nothing to do with it. It's simply a wrong category. You cannot earn your way into a family. God's blessing is sonship. And so effort can have nothing to do with it. Your efforts can make you a slave. 
but no amount of effort can make you a son. All our efforts to win God's salvation by our own strength will only produce slaves, slaves who do not inherit. But sonship is free. And this is right at the heart of the Christian battle, knowing that the only blessing God has is completely of grace. Free adoption for real sinners. Because naturally, I go through life thinking, I'm so inconstant, I'm so faithless, I'm so riddled with sin, my Christian life is so poor, and so I doubt God could love me. But that's why our Christian lives are so poor, because we've bought this satanic inversion of the gospel that once I sort myself out, then God will love me. What would any kind father think hearing that from their child? The father hearing his child thinks she needs to earn his love. And you know, that Abba cry, it tells us something else as well about how the Trinity shapes the gospel. For that cry is not just about our new status before God. Those who call on God as their father do so not just because they can, but because they've been transformed. See, the natural sinful mind, Paul says earlier in Romans 8 verse 7, is hostile to God. It hates God. But in salvation, Romans 5.5, 5, God has poured his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit he's given us. Turning our hearts. This is what the Spirit does. He turns our hearts from our natural love of sin and hatred of God. He turns our hearts so that we love God and hate sin. And so believers cry, Abba, not just because they're allowed to, but because they now adore him as their father. Now think, for eternity, God the Father has delighted in his perfect son. The Son has delighted in His Father and the fellowship of the Spirit. And we've been created that we might share that. That we might glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Just as the Spirit moves on the firstborn Son, He works on all the sons of God. God pours His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and we too cry out, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. As it is with the Father and the Son, so it is with us. The Spirit catches us up to share their mutual pleasure. And this, friends, is the heartbeat of what it means to be holy with this God. What it means to be godly. It's why Jesus says in John 8, 42, If God were your Father, you would love me. For the Father's very identity consists in his love for his Son. And so when we love the Son, we reflect what is most characteristic about the Father. It is the prime reason the Spirit is given to us. You know, the Puritan John Owen wrote, Therein consists the principal part of our renovation into the image of God. Nothing makes us so like God as our love for Jesus Christ. 
That's when you're really being like God, when you love the Son as he does. So the Spirit makes us, like the Father, love the Son. And the Spirit gives us the mind of Christ. And what is characteristic of the Son? John 14, 31, I love the Father. The heart of our transformation into the likeness of the Son is our sharing in his deep delight in the Father. And so in our love and enjoyment of the Son, we're being like the Father. In our love and enjoyment of the Father, we're being most like the Son. That is the happy life the Spirit calls us into. So how great and lovely then is the work of the Spirit? He unites us to the Son so that the Father's love for the Son encompasses us. He draws us to share the Father's enjoyment of the Son. He causes us to share the Son's delight in the Father. What could be more delicious than to keep in step with the Spirit whose purpose is that? And it means something wonderfully transformative. For the Spirit is not just about bringing us to some mere external performance for God, but bringing us to find we love Him, we find our joy in Him. What we love and enjoy is foundationally important. And you should think about this today. What do you really enjoy? It's far more significant than your outward behavior because it is your desires that drive your behavior. What you want, what you long for, drives how you live. The Father, Son, and Spirit love and enjoy each other. And our problem is that our desires have been off kilter. We've desired other things, that we are made to enjoy God. That's what humanity was created for. We've turned to love and enjoy other things, things that aren't able to satisfy. But the Spirit's first work is to set our desires in order, to open our eyes and give us the Father's own relish for the Son the Son's own enjoyment of the Father. You know, the Heidelberg Catechism captures this brilliantly. It asks, what is the coming to life of the new man? Answer, so what is regeneration? Answer, it is wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a delight to do every kind of good as God wants us to. See, the Spirit would never be interested merely in empowering us to do good, merely. His deeper desire, which is the desire of the Father and the Son, is to bring us to such a hearty enjoyment of God through Christ that we delight to know him that we delight in all his ways, and that therefore, because we delight in him, we want to do as he wants, and we hate the thought of grieving him. That is the life the Spirit gives. He gives us himself, opening up to us the lovely fellowship of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He wins our hearts to share their satisfaction and pleasure in each other. And there's just one more brief thing to note from the very last few chapters of Romans. In the gospel from Romans 12 on, we see the Spirit not only reconciles us to God, He reconciles us to each other. So you see, 
The Spirit leads us to Romans 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly, familial affection. For the God of peace and fellowship reconciles male and female, black and white, Jew and Gentile, all to the same uniting love of God, which spills over into a heartfelt love of each other. And so the Father, Son, and Spirit share their heavenly harmony, that there might be harmony on earth, that peoples of different genders, languages, ethnicities might be one in peace and love, and that one day, with one heart, one spirit, one voice, we might cry, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Only such a relational, intrinsically harmonious God could or would do that. So, how does the Trinity shape the gospel? The Trinity makes the gospel. With the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we have a God of love, a God we'd want to know, a God we can trust. The Trinity makes salvation possible, and the Trinity makes salvation sweet. Only with this God are we freely welcomed in together as brothers and sisters to share the very joy of God and cry together, Our Father. And so now, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You just heard Dr. Michael Reeves with an encouraging message about our triune God. And far from abstract doctrines with no relevance for today, these foundational Christian truths are what we need to be faithful witnesses for Christ in a lost and confused world. Don't forget that you can find resources from Dr. Reeves and our other speakers in Ligonier's online conference bookstore, since we're about to head into a short break, make sure you take some time to browse the significantly discounted collection at ligonier.org bookstore. There you'll find hundreds of helpful books, teaching series, and more to further your study and your growth in the knowledge of our holy God. As heirs of the Protestant Reformation, we embrace the Latin phrase soli deo gloria, which means to God alone be the glory. The whole of our salvation and everything in our lives is for God's glory. And that includes our everyday work and vocations. We'll be back at around 11.35 Eastern Time, and Dr. Harry Reader is going to deliver a message titled, Working for the Glory of God. I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I'll see you back here for our next session. I grew up on the streets. In my youth, I was in and out of juvenile. I'm selling a lot of drugs. I get the attention of the federal government. And at 21 years old, I'm indicted on a federal drug trafficking conspiracy. As soon as you get arrested, everybody tells you, turn to God, read the Bible, pray. And in my mind, I'm like, no, why turn to God? There'd be apartments right here. On several occasions, I was shot at. Well, right there from somebody over here. During this time, my then girlfriend was going to church. I didn't know. She knew I was against it. She knew I, I didn't support it. I had never read the Bible. I had never even looked at it. I don't even know what's what. She says, read the book of John. She wanted me to read the Gospel of John, but I ended up reading 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And I never forget those verses where that verse said that God is love. And then the other verse where it says, this is love that he sent his son. I didn't know what that meant at that time, but I knew I was, I was blown away about the simplicity of it and about that truth that God is love. 
I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know who to pray to. I didn't know what to say. I said, God, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. But one thing I do know, I want to know you and I want to serve you. I had new desires that, 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 that I knew something had happened. From that day on, we started a Bible study. Uh, when I got sentenced, it was a sentence of 156 months, which comes out to 13 years. And in a lot of ways, I was grateful. But of course, you know, you know, it's a long time. This one occasion, we, we, we got in a heated argument. The brother was saying that you could not lose your salvation. And all of us were saying, yes, you could lose your salvation. He goes, I, I want to give you a book. This will, help, this will help you understand, you know. I said, yeah, okay, give me the book. I'll read it. I said, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. And the book he handed me, of course, was chosen by God. And Dr. Sproul, when I read the truth, it's just, it was just like, I was just overwhelmed. Like, man, I, I can't get over it. Little did I know that, that God was going to prepare me to preach and teach to these brothers. Four months before I was going to be released, providentially, an old friend came into my, into my life, and that was my, my, my now wife. There's testimony after testimony from every, every angle. I mean, whether it be from work, relationships, friendships, church. I mean, every, yeah. you know, the, God's hand is literally at, at every angle. It's beyond expression, you know. It's, there's just so many things you could share. What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? And when I, when I think of the grace of God in my life, nobody knows more than me that I have absolutely no right to be such a recipient of such grace. And, and when I read this verse, man, it just, the joy of the Lord just runs through the blood in my veins.
we're joined by Dr. Stephen Lawson. Dr. Lawson, this weekend at our national conference, you're going to be addressing the Bible and how we need to stand firm on our conviction that the Bible is the Word of God and we mustn't compromise. Amen. How do you answer the critics that say, you know, the Bible's just an old book. What could it possibly <laughs> have any relevance for today? Well, first of all, anyone who would say that has an unconverted uh, mind and heart. So, of course, they're not going to see the relevance of the Bible because they don't know God mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. So that's an outsider looking in. Um, if they had a renewed mind, then they would see that this is the most relevant book that has ever been written in the history of the world, that it speaks to every heart in every generation on every continent. And so they're blind, so they can't see. And God needs to give them eyes to see. So that's the very clear answer to your question. I think all evangelicals would at least give lip service to say they love the Bible. Yeah. They love the Word of God. Yeah. But it's not uncommon when it comes to life decisions, who should I marry, yeah. where should I work, that they're waiting for a still small voice. And they're not looking <laughs> to the Word of God for counsel, but yeah. they want God to speak to them directly. Yeah. What do you say to them? Well, the Bible is our guide for everything. And while it may not address specifically the name of the job you're to have or which house you are to buy or the name of the woman you're to marry. Nevertheless, there are timeless principles that guide us into the will of God such that you should only marry a believer. And which woman would help you most glorify God? And aspects like that. And so that's why you need to know really the whole Bible. J.C. Ryle once said it takes a a whole Bible to produce a whole Christian. And so you need to be aware with all of the timeless principles in the Scripture, and they, it'll be like a compass that will direct you onto the path of God's will. Our theme this weekend mm -hmm. is stand firm. Yeah. And you know, Christians are facing greater opposition, at mm -hmm. least in these United States that they have in recent times. Um, there are some on college campuses, they're in workplaces, they want to be bold in their faith, but they're, they're trying to stay out of the line of fire. This, uh, can I put my head down? I want to study. I want to just do my job well. How do you encourage them, mm -hmm. and, and what does it look like to stand firm when you're out there in a secular workplace or school? Yeah, well, it boils back to the word convictions, and the deeper your convictions are in the Word of God, the stronger will be your witness for the truth in Scripture. So I, I understand that we all face some hesitancy. We don't want to uh, offend people and we don't want to be cut off, et cetera. However, the deeper our roots are in the scripture, the more there will be the fruit of an outgoing witness and to speak up for, for Christ. Um, in the book of Acts, every time it says someone was filled with the spirit, either the rest of the verse or the next verse, it says they opened their mouth and spoke with boldness. So it really does boil back to being filled with the Spirit, being governed and controlled, empowered by the Spirit of God, and you cannot help but speak out for Christ, regardless of what the, uh, the, the, the result will be. So, filled with the Spirit, deeper convictions in the Word. It, it, Jesus really said what's done in the heart comes out of the mouth, and, and what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. <laughs> And so to be filled with the Spirit and the Word of God in the heart, it will come out of the mouth. Now, for those that watch your message, mm -hmm. perhaps they come away and they say, you know, I need to be in the Bible more. Absolutely. Uh, I need to spend more time in the Bible. What does that look like? How have you maybe engaged with the Bible differently throughout your life and ministry, and how would you encourage them to, to get in the Word? Yeah, sure, Nathan. Um, and we do go through different seasons in our Christian life, uh, different approaches to reading the Bible, everything from read through the Bible in a year, to taking one book in the Bible and reading through that multiple times. Uh, I'm a big believer in taking a book in the Bible and read. What I like to do is, is make a photographic copy of that book where I have a pen in hand, and as I read it, I mark it up, underline, circles, arrows, asterisks, where I'm interactive with it. And you've got to read it several times. Obviously, a shorter book, it's easier to do that. But it's not just that we get into the Word of God. The Word of God needs to get into us. And so after doing that, you really need to pray through that and make it personal in, in my own life that God would incorporate what I'm reading in, into my daily walk with the Lord to really seal it on the inside. So that, that would be my encouragement 
either read through the whole Bible in a year or take one book in the Bible and try to master it in some way. I really like that idea. Take a photocopy, one yeah. book, reread it, pray I've through it. I've done that my, my whole life, and I like doing it with a study Bible, like the Reformation Study Bible, and there are other study Bibles where you have some notes at the bottom as well that you can reference as you're reading. It's especially helpful, like with Old Testament books, some historical background as you're reading through this. Mm -hmm. That's really practical advice. Well, Dr. Lawson, I'm grateful for you, for your time, and thanks for being with us this weekend. Thank you, Nathan. Love the conference. Hi, my name is Mady Martin, and I serve as Director of Admissions here at Reformation Bible College. I'm so excited to take you on a tour of our campus here in Sanford, Florida. This is Aaron. Aaron is our lead admissions recruiter and an RBC alum. Our founder, Dr. Archie Sproul's vision was that we would be a college faithfully educating students to better help know, serve, and worship God throughout all of life. Our first stop is Founders Hall. This is our newest building on campus and where most of life at RBC happens. Here you'll find our main classrooms, faculty offices, library, and our student commons. We even host some of our events and small conferences in the main hall. This is one of my favorite places on campus, our cafe and bookstore. So whether you want to break for coffee or pick up something on the way to class, this is a nice perk of this building. You can even purchase some RBC swag or books by our faculty. Our student commons is the heart of RBC student life. What sets RBC apart is our community, where discipleship is encouraged by our staff, faculty, and campus pastors. A lot of that discipleship is actually driven by our own students, where we have bi-weekly Bible studies, and it's not uncommon to see our students praying and studying throughout the campus. We are now in the library. Here, students can find thousands of sources and articles written by key figures of the Reformed classical tradition to help them study for their classes and write their papers. The library also houses the Hanson Rare Book Room. These doors are modeled after the doors of the Black Cloister, which was a former monastery that became Luther's home in Wittenberg. Now, if you want to see what's behind those doors, you are going to have to visit us on campus. Here at Reformation Bible College, we teach theology for life, meaning wherever the Lord calls you in the future, you have a solid biblical truth to build upon. Our academic curriculum is focused for students to learn communication, critical thinking, and problem solving. This is Simpson Hall, our largest classroom. In here, among other classes, students are learning great works of the literature, history, systematic theology, philosophy, and more. This map reminds our students of the global task of making God known. Knowing the truth is the first step to communicating and defending the truth. Founders Hall also contains more classrooms and other study areas. Behind us is the administration building. This houses the admissions office, a few small classrooms, and the office of our president, Dr. Nichols. And if you know the history of Dr. Sproul's ministry, when you visit that building, see if you can find the original sign from the Ligonier Valley Study Center. This beautiful campus is a blessing from the Lord, and we're so grateful to see it continue to expand and serve a growing student body. By God's grace, every student who walks through the doors of RBC will be equipped to spread the gospel and stand for the truth in whatever calling the Lord has for them. Since you just received a taste of what RBC campus is really like, we invite you to come visit us in person. Our admissions team is looking forward to hearing from you.
one hammer in the hand of an obscure Augustinian monk changed the world forever. Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg, Germany, calling his fellow professors to examine issues of supreme theological importance. Thus began the Reformation, through which the light of God's Word was brought out of the darkness to shine with clarity once more. One of the central cries of the Protestant Reformation was this, the just shall live by faith. Luther's development of the doctrine of justification by faith alone recovered the gospel that had been hidden during the Middle Ages. And at the center of that gospel is the affirmation that the righteousness by which we are declared just before a holy God is not our own. It's a foreign righteousness, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that Luther said is extra nos, apart from us. Namely, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That righteousness that is imputed or counted for all who put their trust in Him. Because of that affirmation, Luther was involved in serious controversies, controversies that culminated in his being brought to trial before the princes of the church and even before the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. And there at the Diet of Worms summoned in Germany, Luther was called upon to recant his views. He answered his interlocutors by saying, Revoco? You want me to say, Revoco? That I recant? I will not recant unless I'm convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason. I cannot recant, for my conscience is held captive by the word of God. And to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. In every generation, the gospel must be published anew with the same boldness and the same clarity and the same urgency that came forth in the 16th century Reformation. The church has always done this in both the spoken word and in song, producing hymns that tell us of the great salvation that has been wrought by God alone through Christ alone. These hymns that you hear today are sacred music for the church, giving glory to the Holy One.
Nathan W. Bingham, and you're with us live at Ligonier's 2023 National Conference. Yesterday and today, we've heard several messages on how Christians must stand firm for God's truth in a world that is growing increasingly hostile to the truth. Earlier this morning, we thought about what that means for our marriages, and our next message will focus on our families and vocations. How can Christians glorify God at home, in the workplace, or wherever it is that the Lord has us? To help us provide a biblical answer to that question, we're about to hear from Dr. Harry Rita with a message titled, Working for the Glory of God. If you've uh, got your copies of God's Word, would you turn with me to our a text assigned, which is a little bit of a story here. Uh, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So let me start this way. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll be down at verse 31. So uh, I guess most of you know that uh, things run pretty much on time, on track here at Ligonier, as you can see, pretty dependable on the calendar, the schedule. And uh, so when you're invited to speak, which I'm privileged to be here and grateful to be here, I, uh, you usually get, um, you get your theme, you get your text, and you get your time. And uh, for some of us, that's a little unusual. Uh, the theme, the text, and the time, but, uh, but we get it. And um, you know, normally I'm, my ministry is one of expository preaching, so I, the text just kind of comes up, Lectio Continua, working through. But now to get a text and then to do an expositional sermon on the text that's assigned, and 
expository preaching, obviously, is a hallmark and a blessing in this ministry for uh, multiple reasons. I can't help but remember a time this fellow came to Briarwood. And by the way, you're all invited. Uh, come to Briarwood. Come to Birmingham, Alabama. Come to Alabama. It won't be a culture shock when you get to heaven. So just come and join us. You'll really enjoy it. So, um, so this fellow met me at the back. He said, are you Harry Reader? And I said, yes. He said, uh, well, I'm here today. I said, well, praise the Lord. And he said, uh, I've been listening to you for three years. I didn't know you were right here in Birmingham. I thought you were one of those California guys. And I said, no, we're right here. He said, well, listen, I've been looking all over for a suppository preacher. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, I, I think I got some elders that'll agree with that description. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he was, uh, became a good friend and is still there, thankfully. Um, so I got the theme uh, when the, with the invitation, stand firm. And I must say to you, I was exhilarated uh, by the theme because of this present age and this present distress whereby we find ourselves in... Um, serving Christ in this world. So I was uh, thrilled with that for a number of reasons. And then, I, and then uh, later, I got, the, <laughs> I got my text, which was 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Well, I just looked at it and I said, oh, they're wanting me to preach on the glory of God as related to standing firm. And then I looked a little closer. In fact, my wife, I think, looked a little bit closer and said, no, I think they want you to preach on the glory of God in the theology of work and vocation. Well, I'd already done my work and I'd already gotten very excited about the glory of God in relationship to standing firm, the theme. So uh, this is um, Omaha, Omaha, Omaha. <laughs> How many of you know what that is? That's an audible. Now, by the way, I happen to have a member who played for the Denver Broncos, and I said, when Peyton Manning says, Omaha, 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 what does that mean? He said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and uh, so, but it means I, I called and went right to the top of Ligonier to get permission to take the theme, and how does the glory of God work in relationship to standing firm, which will allow us to look at a theology of vocation uh, briefly as well. I went right to the top. And no, that's not, I didn't, uh, that's not Chris Larson, that's Vesta. And uh, <laughs> people have always thought I had a good friendship with the RC, which I did. And I was very grateful for it. We had a lot of things in common, a lot of discussion. And of course, I valued him as one of my professors in the 1980s. And um, so deeply appreciated him. But I, I became friends with Vesta because I found out she graded all the papers. And so, but anyway, Chris was very gracious. And uh, so I want to do this with you. Now, standing firm attracted my attention very quickly. It attracted my attention very quickly because I do believe we are in a very crucial time. I, I did not surprise me that Ligonier would sense that. And, or, and orient a conference to help us as believers stand firm because there is clearly um, a present conflict that is going on. Uh, it has rightly been understood as, a, um, as a, a, a conflict of almost revolutionary proportions, a conflict in which uh, the church is under assault, uh, Christendom is under assault throughout what is Western civilization, we are in a, now let me be clear about this, we are in a spiritual war, not a culture war. It is a spiritual war. The culture is one of the battlefields. The church is one of the battlefields. The current ism of the age, progressivism, secular progressivism, its, it's um, focus is deconstruction, and it wants to deconstruct Western civilization, particularly removing the influence of what has historically been called Christendom in this imperfections of what has been known as Western civilization. And then progressive Christianity, which I don't think ultimately is Christianity at all, is penetrating the evangelical church, and again, 
the theme is deconstruction. How many times have we picked up in the last three to four years um, previous leaders that we have read and looked at that now say, well, I'm halting and I'm examining my Reformed and evangelical faith and engaged in the deconstruction of it. The battlefields are the culture. The battlefields are, uh, would be the church. The battlefield would be uh, your own life, your own family. And I think the call to stand firm is one that we need to hear, we need to respond to, we need to, we need to embrace. But stand firm is not passive. Stand firm is for a purpose. We stand firm so that we can stand up. And we stand firm to stand up so that we can speak out. And when you speak out, and you speak up. And when you stand firm, stand up, speak out, speak up, then you stand out, and that means you will be assaulted by Satan. This should not surprise us. Spiritual warfare should not surprise us at all. I have many times people will say, you know, Pastor, I think I'm going through spiritual warfare. And um, I'll say, well, tell me what you mean, and they'll begin to explain it to me. But you need to understand something. Spiritual warfare is not a subset of Christianity that comes into your life periodically. Spiritual warfare is the Christian life. We're always engaged in it. We may have seasons of respite, but spiritual warfare is something that Jesus told us is going to be present constantly in front of us continually before us. That marvelous moment when he gathers his disciples and says to them, peace, peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. In the world, you have tribulation. In me, you have peace. Take courage. I have overcome the world. Or as we heard from one of our previous speakers, that glorious promise in Matthew 16. As Peter confesses Christ, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And then he tells them, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Satan is constantly on the attack. Now, make no mistake about this either. We are in a spiritual war, but the war has been won. The war has been won in Christ. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he took on his and our enemies, and he defeated sin, Satan, death, hell, and the grave. And when he said, Tetelestai, it's finished, victory had been accomplished. Then three days later, the resurrection is the announcement of the triumph of Christ by the Father as the same Spirit who came upon him, in, who came upon him at his baptism, went with him in the wilderness throughout his teaching, brought him to the cross, brought him out of the grave. That same Spirit that brought him out of the grave at the directive of the Father then announces to all of us. He was delivered up for our transgressions. He was raised. He was raised for our justification. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who is raised again, who is at the right hand of the Father, and even now intercedes for us. Christ victor. Christ was risen. Because Christ is risen, now we have been set free from the guilt, the shame, and the dominion of sin. And that is the gospel message. Christ delivers his people from their sins. He has bound the strong man. He has bound the strong man. And now he has unleashed his church. He has unleashed his church 
on a glorious enterprise. He has unleashed His church on a God-glorifying, Christ-exalting, Spirit-filled enterprise, and it is very focused. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Satan, I have bound the strong man, plunder his house. Go and harvest the results and the fruit of my work on the cross. I will send my Spirit. I'll be with you. Why? How? Because the risen Christ sends that same Spirit who was with him from the womb at the baptism into his ministry all the way to the cross, out of the tomb, received him into glory. Now he has poured forth that Spirit upon us and therefore empowers us for this enterprise that's been given to us, but it will not be without opposition. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, how much more will they persecute you? We have adversaries, but we enter into the battles and the battlefield knowing Christ has won the victory. Maybe the best example is if you go over there to the shores of France and you go to the beaches of Normandy, and you stand there and you look up, and as you look up, you see those cliffs. Well, on D-Day, when those boys got to the top of those cliffs, Hitler was done. He was done, and the Third Reich was done. But they still had to go hedgerow by hedgerow, village by village, and town by town. And so it was, and so it is. When Christ came out of that grave, we win. Now we go, family by family, city by city, nation by nation. And when all of His elect have been brought to Himself, then that trumpet will blow. And that's why I love missions and I love evangelism. We're hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know one thing. Out there someday, somewhere, someplace, somebody is going to lead the last of the elect of God to Christ, and that trumpet's going to blow when that happens. And I look forward to that day as the gospel goes to all the nations, but we are in a war to accomplish it. And there are adversaries. And so, as we enter into this, as the adversity comes, as the attempts to prevail over the church comes, but the prevailing church stands, how? Because we stand firm, not in passivity. We stand firm so that we'll stand up. And when we stand up, we speak up. And when we speak up, we speak out. We speak out of the glories of, the, of our triune God. We speak of the glories of our triune God through the preeminence of Christ. The church is making disciples who stand firm, stand up, speak up, speak out. And as they speak up and speak out, they'll stand out, and then Satan puts them right in the crosshairs. And when he puts them right in the crosshairs, then we are ready to, uh, we are ready to serve the Lord, and, 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 where, and how can we then continue to stand firm in those days? Look with me in 1 Corinthians 10. Look at verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That was my assignment. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, let's put it in context. It's 1 Corinthians 10.31. It's the letter, one of three letters we know that Paul may have wrote others, but we know he wrote three. Two of them are, are in the canon. And as he writes this letter to the church at Corinth, he is doing something very specific. He is answering some questions that the leaders have sent to him, and he is answering some concerns he has because of reports he's been given, he's been receiving by uh, individuals such as um, the household of Chloe and others. 
And so he is writing, and there, but there are specifically seven questions that have been sent. You can, when you study the book of Corinthians, you can find it pretty quickly because as he's answering those questions, he, he introduces it with this phrase, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, now concerning. Well, one of those things that they wrote him about that he is answering, now remember, Paul's got a special relationship. As far as we know, this church at Corinth, he spent the second longest length of pastoral ministry time. Three years he spent in Ephesus, and at least 18 months he spent in Corinth. And as he is writing to them and answering these questions, and the church is in all kinds of, has all kinds of problems, not only in the assault from the outside, but also what's taking place inside the church. And that's how Satan works. Satan has three schemes. Intimidation, imitation, and infiltration. He attacks from the outside, usually with intimidation, and he loves to infiltrate the leadership of the church with false leaders. That's what Paul would warn about, false leaders who speak false things, false teaching, twisting the Scriptures, false leaders who lead the disciples not to Jesus but to themselves. Be on guard for that. Sometimes it's wolves in sheep's clothing. Sometimes it's sheep in wolves' clothing. But always be on guard for it. And then you not, only have the, you not only have the problems internally, but you have them externally. And both of them are deadly. <laughs> Listen, the, the battle inside, friendly fire is not too friendly. It really isn't. The battle from the outside, the incoming seems to be incessant. Satan is always at work. How can we stand firm? And that's why I rejoiced at this text. You stand firm through that glorious call and privilege, duty, and honor. That whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I'm just going to give you three things to think about in terms of how this affects standing firm. Here's the first one. Living your life to the glory of God is the fixed point that you need. It's the fixed point whenever you're thinking your way through this. What's my next decision? Marriage, school, military service, vocation? My next step in life is, God, allow me to give glory to you. Allow me to lift up praise to your name. That is ultimately the decision that I want to make. There will be other things that I need to think about. In this text, in particular, the thing he's answering in the, in, the, in the context of these seven questions, there's one that's come to him about idolatry. And in the question about idolatry is another question is, hey, what about, hey, um, Paul, what about when we're going through the market and we see some meat and we see something that we're buying? That could have been offered in a pagan sacrifice. Am I committing idolatry if I'm eating the meat that I bought in the market that came from a sacrifice? Or the drink, or the, or the, uh, or the, grain, or the grain that is there? Am I participating in idolatry? And of course, he gives this glorious answer we call the doctrine of Christian liberty, which talks about our freedom uh, in Christ and that you could freely eat. But Christian liberty has two sides to it, as Paul develops in the text. I'm not only free to do something, and I'm also free to abstain or not to do something if I've got a weaker brother or I've got an opportunity for evangelism and if that, would, if that would hinder my evangelism. So he's developing this doctrine of Christian liberty. But then he says, now here is your fixed point. Whether you eat, whether you drink, or whatsoever you do, here is your fixed point. Do all to the glory of God. 
You have been saved to give God glory. You have been saved from your sins. What were you doing in sin? You were falling short of the glory of God. Now you're saved by God's grace. God's grace is greater than your sin. That means your life has been transformed. And instead of falling short of the glory of God in everything you do, now you can give God glory to God, and that becomes your greatest delight in life. I have transformed you. Now you do not exist in self-absorption and self-preoccupation. Oh, you still got an old man that keeps trying to bring you back to that. But you're no longer under reigning sin. Yes, you've got remaining sin, but you're no longer under reigning sin. You can kill sin and follow Jesus and live to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, listen, whatsoever you do. So he gives us the fixed point. I remember when I was uh, in college, at Covenant College, and I got the privilege because of my role in the pre-ministerial club. I got the privilege to know it. But if you ever go to that college and you go up, you'll see the chapel and the library. And they exist basically because of this man. Uh, some of you are old enough perhaps to remember Kresge uh, Stores. His name was Stanley Kresge, and he had become a Christian philanthropist, and he and his sweet wife came. I was, um, you know, I was a college student ready to meet this capitalist. And... Uh, my goodness, what a gracious, kind man. I, I, was just, I was just astonished the moments that I could spend with him. But I asked him this one question. I said, Mr. Kresge, I don't mean to be intrusive, or, uh, and I certainly want to be appropriate. And if you don't feel like answering this, please tell me. But I can't imagine how many people come to you for gifts and donations. And how do you decide what to give to? He said, well, Harry, there's a number of things I go through, but here's the most foundational. I never write a check that I can't write 1 Corinthians 10.31 at the bottom. The glory of God. If I can't write that, I don't write the check. It became a fixed point in his life. This glorious commitment to the glory of God, and that is why we're in spiritual war, because Satan's obsession is to dethrone God, to deny glory going to God. That is the obsession of the doctrine of demons. That is the obsession of why he intimidates believers. That's why he infiltrates pulpits and leadership and churches and seminaries. That's why, uh, that's why he is constantly attempting to imitate and, and bring imitations of Christianity that actually deny Christianity. The glory of God is this glorious blessing that God has saved us. And now we who participated in the dethroning of God with our life, now our greatest delight is to give glory to God. That is what we desire to do. That is what we want to do. And we say no to Satan. And we say yes to the majesty and glory of God in anything and everything that God has called us to do. Why did God make us? As you so eloquently heard a few moments ago, not because He needed us. He made us for His glory. Why did God save us? He didn't save us because He needed us. Isn't this gospel message amazing? The God of glory, the triune God of glory. This triune God of glory sent His Son to save us from our sins. The God whom we needed but we didn't want was the God who didn't need us but wanted us. <clears throat> and this God authored our salvation. This God the Son accomplished our salvation, and God the Spirit applied that salvation. 
to the praise of His glorious grace. Why did God make us? The Father authored our existence. The Son accomplished our existence. The Holy Spirit superintends the creation so that all of creation would exist and declare the glory of God. And we who are made in the image of God are put over that creation to bring glory to God. And what is the fundamental treachery of sin? It is the denial of glory to God and the foolishness of exchanging the truth of God for a lie and living as if we are the focus of glory. Professing to be wise, we become foolish. That's what you're looking at right now in the cultural battlefield. You're looking at a culture of insanity, absurdity, embracing the obsessions of sexual anarchy, leading to lethality. That's what you're watching. It's incoherent. It makes no sense. But what drives it is not wisdom. It's the doctrine of demons. What drives it is the heart of the problem is the problem with the heart. And the only cure for it is Christ Jesus who gives us a new record, who gives us a new heart, and gives us a new life in which imperfectly, but now intentionally, our delight is the duty of whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. You see, when the church stays on its focus to make disciples through evangelism and discipleship, it turns out disciples, and the key mark of disciples is worship. When Jesus met the disciples at the first general assembly of the church, it's not Acts 15, it's Matthew 28, he meets the eleven, and when they saw him, they what? They worshiped him. Evangelism wins them. They're baptized and enfolded into the church, shepherded and nurtured. They're equipped through discipleship, but you know you've hit the home run when those who fell short of the glory of God now delight to give glory to God. Now, please get this. And the way their delight is expressed is two ways. Number one, gathered worship on the Lord's day. And with all due respect, I'm grateful for technology that I can help shut in people. Praise God. The people that are all kinds of, all, but worship is gathered. Amen. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody in our hearts to God. Here is gathered worship in which the means of grace initiate the discipleship of the believer as we've come together who have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Why? We who have been doxod, blessed by God, now gather to bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Now when we come together to worship, now we're ready to scatter. And here's the second way we give glory, lifestyle worship. In light of the mercies of God, I beseech you, brothers, to present, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Life is worship for the believer. That's why we live. And whenever we fall short, praise God, we can confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us. He says to the Father, Father, forgive them. I paid for it. Now let's move them forward to grow, not for grace. Let's grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, that the glory of God would be seen even more gloriously. So that's that second application that I need to give you. The glory of God in life for the believer is not only a fixed point. It is the foundation of our life. It is the formation of our life. 
It is the motivation of our life. We live on the foundation of God's glory manifested in His Son and poured out by His Spirit. And then God's glory becomes the channel markers for our life as we make decisions about responsibility. What am I going to do with my responsibilities? What am I going to do with my resources? What am I going to do with my relationships? Here's the answer. The glory of God is framing me. God, please give me wisdom from above. And what do I want to do? I want to give you praise. I want to meet you and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That means I desire God. Help me grow so that whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, I do all to the glory of God. Father, I don't live to eat. I eat to live for you. I don't live to drink. I drink to live for you. Whatever I do, that's not the idolatry of my life. That's an instrument in life whereby the latria, the glory of the Father, in the name of the Son and in the power of the Spirit, is my chief desire and delight in the everyday embracing of responsibilities, relationships, and resources. And then the glorious day in the gathering of God's people. The glory of God. Did you see that text that we just read? It's comprehensive. Whatsoever you do, it's comprehensive. It permeates all of life. The glory of God, it permeates it. It penetrates it. And the glory of God is eternal. You know, there's, when you get to heaven, there's two things you're not going to do. I know you're sitting there thinking right now. <laughs> Let me give them to you. You're not going to sin. You're not even going to be able. My accountability group, we don't have to meet. <laughs> I don't need you to call me when I'm at the motel room. I thank God you do now. I'm not going to sin in that day. I won't even be able to sin. And I won't lead anybody to Jesus on that day. I can't do evangelism. So I'll tell you what, why don't we do more evangelism now, knowing we're not going to do any then, and why don't we do less sinning now, knowing we're not going to do any then? And do it, why? For the glory of God. That's why our Westminster divines, they made this marvelous confession, distilling the truths of the Reformation, bringing the strands together around that confession. And it looked so great that Parliament sends them back and says, well, we need to teach elders that. So they make something called the larger catechism as an instrument for pastors to teach elders. Then they make something else. We need fathers to lead their families. So they made a shorter catechism so that fathers could lead and, and, uh, and catechize their families. May I again Again, encourage you the best discipleship tool I have ever used in 40 plus years of ministry is the shorter catechism. Thankful for all the other things. Buy them at the, at the bookstore. <laughs> but learn to use the shorter catechism. For many, it's untried. Most Christians I meet today are catechized more by Fox News and MSNBC than by the Word of God through an instrument that brings you to the Word of God. And therefore, they are, they are marked by the world with its anger and divisiveness and its distrust and its cynicism instead of marked by the confidence of a risen Savior and the power of His Word and the power of the Gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit that we need to be discipled. I thank Mr. Piper, where I read years ago when he made the point that there's one in that shorter catechism question number one, what is the chief, somebody tell me the next word, end or purpose, not plural, singular. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to what? Glorify. Well, that sounds like two objectives, glorify God and enjoy Him. And he rightly pointed out, no, it's still one objective. Now, I'd like to, if you don't mind, edit and just add to what he says very reverently and, uh, grace and calmly. He was right. He said, hey, it's one end that you glorify God by enjoying Him forever. 
But I would also encourage you to see it two ways. The Shorter Catechism has got an objective with two sides. Glorify God and enjoy Him. And you glorify Him by enjoying Him. Let me give you another one. You enjoy Him by glorifying Him. The more you glorify God, the more you're going to enjoy Him. The more you enjoy Him, the more you're going to go. They're interdependent, they're interrelated, and they're reciprocal. And so sometimes I'm entering into the glory of God and my joy multiplies. Sometimes I'm so overjoyed then I will begin to, I, I, I just, I can't wait to glorify God because of all that He's done and all that He is at work in my life. And so this found, this glory of God is not only a fixed point, it's the foundation, it's the formation, it's the motivation. It guides me in my work. You see, that's how we got the word professional. We had this thing. So let me, what I was supposed to be preaching on, let me at least give you a sentence. (laughs) Let me at least give you a sentence on the theology of work. Have you ever heard the word professional? That comes out of the, that doesn't mean some people do this work, some people are professional. No, no. For the Christian, it didn't matter whether you were selling, making bricks, uh, agriculture, it didn't matter. You were a professional when you went to work. You did your work heartily for the Lord and heartily to the Lord, and people saw your relationship with the Lord by the way you did your work. Your work was a profession of your faith. That's the origin of the word professional. So I don't care what it is that you're doing, if it's that which is honorable, hands, mind, whatever it is, we do our work to the Lord, and the way we do our work, we work for the glory of God. We don't make a living. We live for Christ. And one of the ways we do it is in our work. Another way is in our marriage. Another way is in our parenting. Another way is being a neighbor. Another way is the way we do our citizenship. Whatever we do is to be done as a profession of faith, and its purpose is to glorify God as I enjoy Him forever. And the more I enjoy Him, the more it shows up in whatever I do, because I desire for that to be for His glory. So here, is the, here it is so that not only is it a fixed point, not only is the glory of God a foundation, formation, and motivation. Here's the last one, and I've only got two minutes, so here it comes. I'm afraid I'll get shot up in the air. But I, know, <laughs> I, know, I know the Kennedy Center is just right over here, so I'm concerned. <laughs> Here's your third one. The glory of God is the center of your life. It's the circumference. I don't care about doing anything beyond it. It's the center, it's the circumference, and it's the substance of your life. Do you think the Reformation was warfare? Did the Reformers stand firm? Hello. Can I get a Baptist or a Pentecostal? (laughs) Do you think the Reformers stood firm? Yes. Did they stand up? Yes. Did they speak out? Yes. Were they attacked? Yes. And what did they do? They kept standing firm for the glory of God. Can't you see it at Oxford? Mr. Ridley, as Hugh Latimer said to him, octogenarians, Be of good cheer. Play the man. For today we'll light a a candle for Christ that shall not be put out in all of England. Stand firm. And when you do, you're going to be attacked. You keep standing firm. Your fixed point is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's the center, it's the circumference, it's the substance. It's the foundation, it's the formation, it's the motivation as to how you serve Him and how you follow Him and how you love Him. And as churches, as we make disciples using the whole Bible, teaching them to observe what? All that I have commanded. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. 
And as you and I come out of those churches focused on that mission, unleashed by the Spirit of God with the preeminence of Christ to the glory of God, we turn out Christians who, whether they eat or drink, are growing in their ability as to whether they eat or drink or whatsoever they do. I want to do all to the glory of God. And I want to stand firm because I'm in a battle. I'm in a battle for my marriage. I'm in a battle for my, I'm in a battle for my, um, my children. I'm in a battle for my witness. I'm in a battle for my church. I'm in a battle. War's won, but I'm in a real battle. I need the armor of Christ. When I was in college, we all, we all bought a book called William Gurnall's book, who, I, by the way, I love his book on gospel worship. William Gurnall's book, it's a great book. It's called The Christian in Complete Honor, I mean Complete Armor. The Christian, it's his sermons, 40-plus uh, sermons on Ephesians 6, 10 through 21. How you like that for suppository preaching? <laughs> It's 1,600 pages. When I was in college, you could be assured every one of us had bought that book. You could also be assured none of us had read that book in its entirety. <laughs> He's not giving you a model of expository preaching. He's telling you something. He is telling you this is the Christian life. You're at war, a victorious Savior, but you're in the battle. Stand firm, stand up, speak up, speak out, and when you do that, you're going to stand out. That means you're going to draw more fiery darts. Put on the armor of Christ. And when you put on the armor of Christ, stay in the fight. I had to wait to get a hold of the TV versions, but there were two movies I was going to make sure that I saw. One was the, uh, uh, you know, Marine Corps Recon Volunteers uh, they, they would love to go see how Navy SEALs do things. There was a movie called Lone Survivor. It's a tough one. Another one called 13 Days, I mean 13 Hours. So I waited for the TV version, but it was still the horrific, horrific firefights were just overwhelming. And in those two movies, there was two things that were asked constantly at every firefight. First question, are you hit? Are you hit? And if you were, they'd help each other. Brothers and sisters, we're in this together. Let's love one another well. Is there a place that the respite of the world can be seen in the assembly of God's people? Are you hit? We love each other well. Then they'd ask a sa second question. Are you hit? Yes. Next question. Are you still in the fight? Are you still in the fight? For the glory of God in your marriage, your family, your children know daddy will be home tonight. Your wife knows when she leaves, he's coming home. The husband knows his wife's faithfulness. The church knows here are not specialty store people showing up to see if the worship entertains them this Sunday. Here are members of the body of Christ. And the workplace sees people making Christ the profession of faith in the way they do their work to the glory of God as they enjoy Him forever. I know you're hit. I know God's able. Stay in the fight. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together. Pray that you would bless these, my brothers and sisters. And Father, allow us to serve you effectively. Jesus, may you be preeminent to the glory of the Father in the power of the Spirit. And may the glory of our triune God be seen in the lives of your people that the world might know Jesus saves. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That was Dr. Harry Reader with a message titled, Working for the Glory of God.
By God's grace, it was during the Protestant Reformation that the church recovered a healthy and biblical understanding of the dignity and value of our personal vocations. You see, Reformed theology is much more than head knowledge. It impacts the entirety of our lives. That's why I'm excited to share this next free offer with you as our thanks for joining us on the live stream today and for sharing it with your friends. We want to give you a digital reformation resource package featuring several ebooks written by Ligonier's founder, Dr. R.C. Sproul. This resource package includes four titles by Dr. Sproul, including Everyone's a Theologian, Luther and the Reformation, Saved from What, and Dr. Sproul's Expositional Commentary on the Book of Romans. You can receive this entire Reformation resource package for free when you visit ligonier.org slash reformed. Also, don't forget that you can save on a wide selection of discipleship resources in our online conference bookstore. We're about to take a break here in Orlando, so now's a great time for you to explore our discounted selection at ligonier.org slash bookstore. Stock up on books, teaching series, and more while they're available at this low conference rate. After our break, we'll return around 2.30 Eastern time with another Q&A session with several of our speakers. So don't go far. I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I'll see you back here at 2.30 p.m. My life growing up, um, there was a lot of hard times. My parents, they were together till I was about seven, and the house was just always fighting, always arguments, and there wasn't any peace. I struggled a lot with depression and suicidal thoughts, but I wrestled a lot with, like, why am I here? Like, why was I put on this earth to, to suffer? Or why is my life like this? So just questioning, like, is everything meaningless or is there actually a purpose to everything that we do? I tried to find meaning in relationships and in friendships and in shopping and spending money. And just these worthless idols that I thought, okay, if I had this much, I'll be okay. Or if I bought this much, if I looked like this, you know, maybe I'll be content. So just seeking only like peace and joy and fulfillment in these things that couldn't do that. I was constantly disappointed. It just, it never sufficed and never fulfilled me. This is my old school, and this is where I first heard about Jesus. We only became friends in middle school, and she had been going to this church. That church really emphasized Jesus being the only way to heaven, and you can't be saved through any other religion. But there wasn't any emphasis on his love and, and forgiveness and, and to give us rest. I didn't understand, is my relationship still there when, with God when I sin? Um, can I have any assurance? Is it okay to doubt? Um, if you, can you be a Christian and still struggle with depression? So I was grappling with so many of those things and the church couldn't help me. They couldn't answer my questions. I always felt like God was angry at me when I sinned. And so it was basically all like works-based and me keeping up my status with God. I didn't really understand how to grow and, and what I needed to grow until I found Ligonier. One day, a video of Sproul popped up on my YouTube, and it was the first time I ever heard Reformed teaching, and I just fell in love with the way that he taught and how he was able to explain things so simply and so easily. I trust Ligonier to give me sound answers because they hold to the gospel, they preach the gospel with so much clarity and just explained it well, and they're really clear on what they believe and don't believe. There are so many teenagers that are being saved online, but there are so many false teachers out there going over these key doctrines I realized this is not what my church taught. And so I asked Lincolnier, you know, what is a good church to go to? Just being in a sound church has changed my life. I'm able to serve now in so much ways in my church and just having a biblical church where you can trust that, that the word of God is going to be taught on Sundays, is going to be preached, and just having a real community of Christians around you. So I would just really encourage any Christians that have been dependent on Lincolnier and don't have a church to find a church. My life is really different now that I've understood the gospel and what does it mean. I have assurance of salvation now. I, I had no assurance before I learned things like Calvinism. I can trust that, that Jesus really did die for me and I don't need to worry and God's loving and he's my father and, and that whatever I do, that my standing with him is right because of what Jesus did. Even though I thought God only cared about himself and didn't really care about his creation, but learning about the holiness of God, I, I learned that 
he was holy, that he's pure, that he's perfect, that he, and his standard is good, his law is good. And so that made me more in awe of him. And I think that takes off so much worry and, and doubt and just self-destruction because you realize, okay, everything is bigger than me. Like whatever you're going through right now, stress, depression, anxiety, mental issues, family issues, it's bigger than your life right now. It's for God. And, now I'm able to just rest on, on God's providence, on His sovereignty, and knowing that He ordains whatsoever comes to pass and that everything is for my good.